The great candelabrum, the Polyelios, like a giant wheel of the Catholicon of the monastery of Simonos Petra. During the services of the great feasts, the monks set this huge chandelier in motion. Its movements symbolize the presence of the angels, the celestial movements of the spirits. A central ornament of the Polyelios is the double-headed eagle of Byzantium. When in 1453 the Ottoman Turks captured Constantinople, Byzantium with its millinery empire collapsed. However, a part of Byzantium continues to live on today on Mount Atis. Greece, the Aegean, the sacred sea where a hundred islands under the blue sky conjure up dreams of the sun and the vacations. In the north, close to the city of Salonika, the peninsula of Hakidiki stretches out towards the blue Aegean. On the most easterly finger of the Hakidiki peninsula lies the last autonomous monastic republic in the world, Hayon Oros, the holy mountain, or quite simply, Etos, with its capital in Karies, with its 20 monasteries, with its skittis and hundreds of small hermitages, where about 1,200 monks are living today from all over the Orthodox world. The length of its territory is 46 kilometers and its width varies from 6 to 12 kilometers. The entire surface is 336 square kilometers. On the southern tip, rising to 2,000 meters above sea level, is the marble peak which gives its name to the whole peninsula, Aetis. An old legend recalls that one day the most holy virgin voyaging by sea came to the holy mountain and sounded from her son Christ, who gave this wonderful land to her as her garden. It is your heritage, your garden, your paradise, a haven for as many as wish to be saved, said a voice from heaven. Some of the monasteries were built over a thousand years ago and have valuable treasures frescoes, icons, books, manuscripts. But there are no cars, no electricity, no radio or television. No newspapers, no hotels and no women. Entrance to the holy mountain is forbidden to them. The calendar is 13 days in arrears and the Byzantine time system measures the day from the sunset. Five o'clock in the morning by our time, nine o'clock for the Byzantine time. It is early in the morning. Above the peak of the holy mountain, a new day is dawning. On the balcony of Simonos Petra, the Zimandron sounds for the beginning of the divine liturgy. the sacred monastery of Simonos Petra on the west coast of Aetis. It was founded in the 14th century by the holy monk Simon, who, one Christmas night, saw a light shining above the summit of the steep rock, high above the sea. He called the monastery New Bethlehem, 
Simonas Petra has been burnt down and rebuilt three times since then, the last time 90 years ago. At the present time, there are about 60 monks who belong to the monastery, though not all of them are there permanently. The central act of worship during the day in the monastery is the divine liturgy. The commemoration of the death and the resurrection of Christ, the feast of the transfiguration and the sanctification of the world and the whole of creation, the feast of the presence of God among men. The monks bring to the liturgy as an offering every personal experience which they have had alone with God. They even bring their own selves as an offering. They offer their very existence as monks for the salvation of the world. <laughs> And he shall make his about with them, and they shall be his people, and he will be their God. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither sorrow nor crying nor pain, for the former things have passed away. the heavenly banquet of the divine liturgy, the Eucharist, is closely linked here in the monastery with the main meal of the day. The monks pass from the church, the Catholicon, to the trapeza, the refectory.
In the monasteries of Aetis, the refectory is situated just opposite the Catholicon. The heavenly and the earthly are not just two separate things. They are not entirely foreign to each other, but interpenetrate. The one exists within the other, and in everything the earthly complements the heavenly. The piety of the monks sanctifies whatever belongs to daily life. Their meal in common is a foretaste of the future paradise. It is an expression of their communion here and now. And so it will be in my father's house, so it will be in the new eternal Jerusalem. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. It is the same banquet, the agape, which the ancient Christians used to have after the liturgy. The meal is simple. Today, being a feast day, they are tomatoes, boiled potatoes, salad, olives, an apple, cheese, bread, a glass of wine and water. When you are at table, which is laden with different foods, turn your mind to thoughts of death and the last judgment, and you shall easily bring your appetite into subjection. When you take something to drink, have in mind continually the vinegar and gall which they offer to your Lord and God. In the monasteries, as elsewhere in Greece, there is no breakfast. Monday, Wednesday and Friday are fast days. On these days, the monks eat just once a day. No protein foods, no oil, no cheese. Meat is never served, and fish only very rarely. During the course of the meal, complete silence reigns. That's a reading from some spiritual book, so that not only the mouth, but also the ear has some nourishment. Food for both the body and the soul. This is the reader's meal. When the meal is finished, a special bread is elevated and blessed, from which all the monks take a little piece. This bread is called the Panagia, the All Holy One. Eating this bread signifies communion with the Mother of our Lord, signifies identification with her humility and her devotion to God who became man. The Mother of God has particular importance for the Atonite monk. She is not, as Christians of the West believe, considered exempt from original sin, from the fallen condition of the first man. But God, through her acceptance to give birth to his only begotten son, has delivered the world. She is a human being just like any other. Her decision represents the possibility which all men have of opening themselves to Christ, of letting Christ become incarnate in them. In this sense, the spiritual attitude of the Atonite monk has something of a female quality. The Igumenos, which means the leader, the guide, the director, is the name given to the father superior of the monastery. He is elected to this position for life. The Igumenos is at the same time the spiritual father of the monks, to whom they owe absolute and unconditional obedience. The monk has no secrets which are hidden from the Igumenos. As Saint Simeon, the new theologian, has written, with absolute obedience to the spiritual father, the monk is liberated from every kind of internal necessity and inhibition. He confides once and for all his cares to his spiritual father. He no longer lives his own life, nor follows his own will. He has mortified himself to all the temptations of this world. Father Emilianos, the abbot of Simonos Petra, speaks of the relations between the monk and the superior. Είναι λοιπόν ένα τύπο αυτή τη εκκλησία το μοναστήρι. Είναι μια ολόκληρη εκκλησία. 
The monastery is an image, a model of the church, the church in its entirety. It is an assembly of the church. In consequence, the spiritual father, the Igumenos, is in the image of God. He is in the place of Christ and all the others, the monks, form the ranks of the saints, both the living and the dead. The monastery, the sacrament, that is to say, and the spiritual father is the visible element of the mystery, which hides the invisible factor God and all that exists in the church, which does not appear, but is perceived by the intelligence. Since the life, the very existence of a spiritual father, is so sacramental, do you see, so important, it means that it is he who takes these people by the hand, who shapes them, so that they may be able to take their place in the life of the church and of Christ. The superior, therefore, is not only concerned with the food, the daily necessities of the monastery, whatever material needs require attention. He is above all the one who introduces souls into the heart of the mystery so that they can be guided into the perfection of the mystical union with God. One must understand that the monastery is also a kind of society. It is also a genuine community. It is the community of paradise, the community of the kingdom of heaven. It is a community of all the saints in which each one of the faithful, each monk, in the present case, has absolute rights to the life of Christ. And Christ has absolute rights in every soul. The monastery is very important indeed. It preserves the rights of men which he had before the fall, that is to say, the possibility to have God as his very own. This fact the superior has to bring to life every day before the monks, before the disciples of the Lord himself. He is therefore a teacher who, with the knowledge which he imparts, above all the revelations of the knowledge of the true God which he should put into practice before his monks, by the fire which he will kindle in their hearts, or the understanding which he should give to all of them, he makes them to feel Christ as present and also as the one who is to come. Whatever he does day by day, the life of a monk becomes an expectation, a vigilant guard for God. And little by little, he'll take the monk by the hand and lead him up, so to speak, so as to pass unto him the grace of God, because the grace of God accomplishes everything in the mystical life, so that Christ is not simply someone who is expected, but also someone who is addressed. The monk must learn to feel his teacher, the Lord. He should acquire his familiarity, his friendship, just as the choir of the apostles did. And finally, with all this, his own daily toil, and with all the tender attention of the Holy Trinity showered upon the monastery to achieve that other thing, the sense of God as a life, present with him, sleeping with him, rising with him, walking with him. Yes, God sleeps with his disciples, his monks. He rises with them, he walks with them. That is to say, there's a complete communion of God and man. Thus, the spiritual father is, in actual fact, the one who stretches out his hands and presents the disciple to the Lord. It is he who brings down Christ and unites what is separated, the heavens and the earth, and does it so, it becomes a true dance. This is the true purpose of the spiritual father. This is how the monks feel him. That is the reason for the discipline and the obedience which you see, for the love, for the giving of self, for the confidence which are directed to the superior, not as a man, but precisely to Christ. All the monks have this feeling of a sacramental, mystical reality which exists between them, because the spiritual father is not a person who exists only for today in the monastery, but it is he who goes throughout the whole stream of orthodox tradition. He is the one who comes forth from the action of the Holy Spirit. However much he may be a man, the sense of his mere human status is transformed within the monastery. Certainly he is a man, really and truly alive, but he is one who is assumed by God and set apart. Consequently, he no longer leads the life of someone in this world, but while he is walking on the earth, he has the feeling, somehow, that his head is in heaven, that he is living for God. And that is one of the most important things that a monastery has to offer.
or the V Tonsion. The monastic community is a large family which has, as is only natural, certain material needs. Each one of the 40 or so fathers, who at this time are actually in the monastery, has some particular duty for the service of the whole brotherhood. The distribution of duties to the monks takes place at the beginning of the new year. Work is included in the spiritual life of the fathers, although it does not have the same important role which it has in Western monasticism, where the dominating principle is ora et labora, work and pray. During the night, the monastery's mill goes into action, and with a freshly ground flour, they will now bake the bread. We turn back to four o'clock in the morning. While the fathers are singing matins in the Catholicon, about 20 meters away, here in the bakery, the bread is being prepared. One of the priest monks comes to bless the dough. The same dough become bread for the refectory and the altar bread which will be transformed during the liturgy into the body of Christ. The priest monk does differ in any way from his other brother monks, except quite simply by his ordination. All are addressed as father, normally as many are ordained as are needed for the services of the monastery. Theological studies are not necessary. The altar bread for the divine liturgy. The two layers of Tao symbolize the two natures of Christ, the divine and the human. The seal bears the words Jesus Christos Nika, Jesus Christ vanquishes. the kitchen and the monk who has the duty of cook. He doesn't have many different dishes to prepare, vegetables, macaroni, potatoes and, on feast days, fish. During the period of fasting, everything becomes very simple. And there are a lot of fasts in the course of the year. Then the ingredients are limited to beans, peas, lentils, water and salt. The vegetables are almost exclusively from the garden of the monastery. Some things, like fruit and wine, come from the monastery's properties outside Mount Athos. And again, fish, for example, they either take in exchange for something else from adjacent monasteries with fisheries or, in other cases, they buy them. Work is seen simply, not as a necessity, but rather as a counterweight to the intense ascetic exercises. Once, Saint Antonius the Great was praying to God and said, O Lord, I wish to be saved, but my evil thoughts prevent me. Then he saw someone else before him, sitting in front of his hut, weaving a rope. After a little while, this other figure got up and prayed, and then continued once more with his work. It was an angel of God, and he said to him, You do the same, and you will be saved. But the desert fathers used to teach, keep abstinence, have some light handcraft, do not permit any disturbance in your rule of life in yourself, and you will be saved. 
Someone, of course, has to look after the mules, which are the means of transport on Mount Aetis. Someone else must take care for the monks' clothes. The monastery has two small libraries. This is one of them. The fathers borrow books, not, as one might think, in order to carry out some scientific research, but rather to deepen their knowledge about diverse aspects of the Christian faith. Scientific research is here rather the exception, just as, for example, preaching or pastoral activity outside of the holy mountain are not customary for monks. The monk can, of course, undertake research, but he is not obliged to, just as he is not obliged to, but may, preach. One of the most important duties in the monastery is the reception of guests who for certain feasts, such as Easter, can be many. But never a day passes without some pilgrims coming, orthodox pilgrims who want to venerate the holy relics, to pray before the miracle-working icons, to seek help and counsel from the fathers about religious questions which may preoccupy them, as of course about any other kind of problem which they might have. Because of the large number of pilgrims, the Greek government and the holy community in Caries do not allow more than 10 foreign visitors a day to enter the holy mountain, principally researchers and theologians who should have some particular interest. All these people are given free hospitality by the monks. Long, winding paths link the monasteries one with the other. There are no vehicles, with certain exceptions, and no hotels. The fathers receive each of the guests, just as if they were welcoming Christ with particular friendliness and courtesy, as for example these two Germans, one of whom speaks Greek. Where are you from? Which path did you come by to reach Simono Petra? And then come the light refreshments, a glass of water, a little piece of Turkish delight, a little glass of ouzo, a little cup of coffee. The 500 or so years of Turkish occupation have left their mark. Even the monk's habit is characterized by a certain Turkish influence. <laughs> This is the grotto where the founder of Simonos Petra, St. Simon, lived. The monks often come here to pray. The monasteries derive their origins from the hermitages. 
Even today, on the holy mountain, they are monks who lead a solitary life in the desert. Many people say that the dynamism which the holy mountain has to offer to the Orthodox Church comes from them. People from all over Greece come to seek their advice. Their influence is decisive even on the holy mountain and many amazing stories are recounted in connection with their names. Saint Makarios the Great, a monk of the 4th century, writes, the name monk, in the original sense of the word, means one who is alone because he remains far from women and renounces the world, both entirely and externally. Externally, because he renounces the material things of this world, and entirely because he excludes from his heart even the very thought of these things. On the other hand, the monk is called so because he prays without ceasing to God in order to purify his intelligence from all harmful thoughts so as to be alone by himself. And by avoiding every evil thought, he lives in complete purity before the one true God and passes every day of his life in the presence of God. Saint Johannes Klimakos, abbot of the monastery of Sinai in the 7th century, presents the spiritual ascent of the monk as a ladder with 30 steps which elevate man to good. They ascend from the Arsanas, the little harbor of Simonas Petra, right up to the monastery, which stands 330 meters above sea level, forms a splendid comparison. Saint Johannes writes, as many as attempt to climb to heaven while they are still living in the body, must submit themselves to force and ceaseless pains, and certainly when they are at the beginning of their spiritual struggle, until our lustful habits and our unfeeling hearts are transformed into love for God and purity through active compunction. In order that they should come out as vanquishers, they will renounce everything, they will disdain everything, they will mock everything, they will shake off everything. What the saint writes seems so simple, but then you think of how men are with their weaknesses. To be a monk doesn't mean to be sure to be free from temptations, free from sin. Thus many will fail, turn away, be lost. How gravely one may sin, even in one's thought. As high as a monk may ascend, so deep can be his fall. The peak of Atis is the symbol of the ultimate aim of the monastic life. The route is long, gorgeous, precipices, impassable forests loom up in front. The toil and the Deprivations often make you lose sight of the peak. But the important thing is the fact of arriving there at the top. What really matters is the way itself and how you advance. And that one knows the ultimate destination of the way, which in fact leads to the very heart of man. Every monk of Simon Aspetra will eventually come to this little house. This little gate opens out onto the cemetery with its few graves. For three years, the monk's dead body remains in the earth and afterwards gives up its position to another. The remains of the body are transferred to the charnel house. When you enter with a monk, you don't feel either frightened or nauseated. On the contrary, it is a pleasant place, light and clean. The fragrance of the flowers which bloom just under the window. Death has nothing frightening here. The bones of a monk are placed there in a basket on the floor. They were dug up just a few weeks ago when another old monk died. For three months, they remain there like that. Afterwards, the fathers will come and clean them and will arrange the bones with the others. The skulls with the skulls, the tie bones with the tie bones. And you think to yourself how beautiful it must be to die here where the love of the brethren surpasses even death. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love our brethren, writes Saint Johannes. The fathers like to come to this place where the bones of their predecessors repose, where the remembrance of this 
or that monk, whom one used to know well, is still very close. On the holy mountain, there are many holy relics. Here at Simonas Petra, for example, there's the left hand of Saint Mary Magdalene. The monks honor these relics because they are a reminder, tangible evidence of the saints, a continued presence, because there's an immediate connection between these material relics and the person who lives in eternity. So in this way, the ostuary is also a symbol of the community of the fathers, past and present, of Simonas Petra of the community of the living and the dead, of those who must keep up the ascetic struggle to ascend the ladder still, and those who have already passed the threshold. In other words, nothing separates them except only the threshold of death. And the fathers come here to the monastery in order to pass the threshold of death. For the world, they are already dead, and they die every day, every hour, every minute. They die by renouncing the temporal things of this world, trying to draw nearer to Christ, to be united with him, to cease to exist as individuals. Death is the way of life of the monk, and life is the way in which he dies. Lord Jesus Christ, grant them eternal repose. The monk repeats continuously this prayer, which is a variant of the so-called prayer of the heart. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. A hundred times, a thousand times, every day, with his komboskini, his prayer rope, he prays, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. Saint Johannes of the Leda writes, don't try to use many words so that the mind is not distracted by looking for words. One word of the publican reconciled him to God, and one single faithful word saved the thief. The monk, says St. Johannes Chrysostomos, whether he eats, whether he drinks, whether he's sitting or working, or whatever else he may be doing, should repeat without ceasing, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. It is with such simple words that the monk approaches his God. The essence of God is, of course, incomprehensible and unapproachable to man. But in every single thing that exists, in the rock, in the water, in the plants, in the light, in every creature of God, one can discern God. The monk in his prayer surpasses the appearance of things and seeks the dazzling light of the transfiguration where there is no longer knowledge but union where the ego ceases to be. Where God becomes man and man becomes God. Where God is all in all. These are the cells of the monks, the place where they go to be alone with God. The icons by the doors of the cells show the patron saints of those who inhabit the cells. The cell of an icon painter. The painting of an icon is something more than just a handcraft or an art. The monk prepares for his work with prayer and fasting. The colors in the form of every icon are precisely defined by ancient tradition. The painting of an icon is an act of piety. In the Orthodox tradition, the grace of Christ, of the Holy Virgin and of the saints overshadow their icons. For this reason, there's always a special reverence for icons.
The monk's bed. The cell of the young novice whom we met at the tailor. A coloured mat as a bed, a little stool for prayer, a chair for the visitor, a small trunk for his clothes, one or two books, a pack for his habit. The monk doesn't possess anything else. The prayer of Jesus is also said like this. Some of the fathers performed thousand or more prostrations in one night, sometimes all their lives. The prostration signifies the fall and rising again of a man, sin and forgiveness, death and resurrection. But with the prostration, we also have the participation of the body in prayer, an expression of the unity of soul and body. It is towards evening. The fading light of day covers the monastery and the holy mountain. A long day comes to an end amidst the nature. The bell sounds for Vespers. For the fathers, with the setting of the sun, a new day begins. And while the plants, the animals and people in the world go to sleep, the monks voyage from the haven of this world to the boundless sea of the search for God. of holy glory of the eternal heavenly father the holy and blessed Jesus Christ coming to the setting of the Sun beholding the evening light we celebrate the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit God The hymn of the monks, their particular manner of singing the ancient Byzantine melody, the half-light of the Catholicon, which is divided into three parts, the icons with their dark colors, and the little lamps hanging before them, the faint gleam of gold, the candles, the chandelier, the fragrance of the incense, intensity of prayer. You stand for hours during the night services and you don't understand how the time has passed. You have all the time in the world and the time passes so quickly. You are off on an endless journey to yourself, to your own beloved, to God, to God. Everything and everyone is close to thee and thou to them. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me.
Between Thespus and Matins, which begin at two o'clock in the morning, the monks are in their cells. The darkness, the silence, and the solitude help with concentration. Before the world, the monk is then alone by himself with God. He has forever had the unique aim of his intelligence, God. The experiences of the monk during these hours are inexpressible. Saint Johannes the Baptist, the Hermit of the Jordan, the very first monk. the Most Holy Mother of God. The Pantocrator, the almighty ruler of the universe. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. St. John of the Letter writes, those whose intelligence has learned to pray truly, they speak to God face to face. The vigil and the prayer of the monk once again conclude with the prayer of the community.
Five o'clock by our time, nine o'clock at Simonos Petra. Above the peak of the holy mountain, a new day is dawning. Yet another day. There are seven days in a week, four weeks in a month, twelve months in a year, ten years, hundred years, thousand years. But what does time matter? On the balcony of Simonos Petra, the Simandron sounds follow worship in common. When you speak about the holy mountain, they ask you, what do the monks actually do? Nothing, you tell them. Nothing. They pray and they die. And those who ask you don't understand your answer. What is prayer after all? And as for death, nobody speaks about it. No work, no offering to society, no social engagement, no productivity, no business. But as humanity, even the slightest thing in comparison with what exists on Mount Athos and among its monks. Finally, a kind of analogy comes to your mind. Athletes prepare whole years in advance in complete silence and with rigid discipline for the Olympic Games. They exercise the human body to the utmost limit. The monks of the Holy Mountain exercise the possibilities of the human heart as deep as it goes, the original idea and hope. According to an old Jewish tradition, the world will continue to exist as long as there are 36 righteous men in every generation. Are you the writers who preserve the world, you ask? Yes, replies the monk. Yes. <laughs> 